Hello students, welcome to Fatigue Analysis. I'm Dr. Stewart. Today, we're gonna to do our final lecture for variable amplitude loading. We're gonna cover life estimation approaches, sequence effects, and the effect of variable amplitude loading on crack growth. Let's start with life estimation. There are three methods that we've learned uh, to solve and to predict the life of components. One of them was a stress life approach. The stress life approach, uh, specimen are subjected to a constant stress amplitude, and then the cycles to failure are, are arrived at from experiments. And, and, and these experiments are done under a constant stress amplitude all the way to failure. Now, under variable amplitude loading, we are not at a constant stress amplitude. Instead, we have varied uh, stress amplitudes throughout our test. So what we need to do is we need to apply our cycle counting algorithms to the load history data for our component and process it into a series of load ranges and means and stress ranges and mean values. We then can take those sorted uh, stress amplitudes and apply cumulative damage models in order to make life predictions. So overall, this box here is the traditional stress life approach, and the addition that we're adding is our cycle counting algorithms and our cumulative damage model. The second method we learned in this class is the strain life approach to fatigue lifing. This approach is a local approach, meaning it is focused on critical locations in components. So what we need to do is we need to actually locally measure the stress and strain fields in the vicinity of notches that simulate our component. And then we need to take that information and we need to process it. And we have an approach to do that, to, to process that variable amplitude data. The preferred method is to use the rain flow counting algorithm, where we rotate our, our uh, load history data, and then we draw rain lines, like rain is flowing off the roof of a pagoda. And if those rain lines are allowed to flow all the way into infinite time, then that means we can form a complete hysteresis loop. And for those where we get stuck, where we encounter another part of the roof, we'll end up with partial loops, right? Once we've uh, used that rain flow method and we've created this, these hysteresis loops, we can then go and use uh, the Morrow mean stress correction uh, uh, version of the strain life equation, and we can use our cumulative damage equations to predict cycles to failure. Of course, this is a fairly complicated process. The third method that we learned about in this class is linear elastic fracture mechanics. This is where we actually uh, try to predict the crack growth rates in structures and try to integrate to find what is the critical crack length and cycles to failure within a structure. For fatigue crack growth, uh, variable amplitude loading depends not only on the range of stress intensity factors and stress ratios, but very significantly on the previous load history. Meaning if we cycle and we go and, 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 and do some compressive residual stresses by doing an overload of compression, then we could retard the growth of, uh, the, the, we could retard the crack growth rates. We can slow it down and actually improve the fatigue life of a component. So for fatigue crack growth, for the, for the linear elastic fracture mechanics approach, we have to deal with the issue of load sequence. And we have to also think about how that load affects subsequent crack growth rates. Now, in fatigue crack growth uh, models for variable amplitude loading, we can do it different ways. We could use a very simplistic approach or we can use very complex uh, approaches that require e extensive computation. To avoid the high cost of field failures, laboratory test methods have been developed to approximate 
the results of field, field experiments. What we do is we'll take an idealized version of variable amplitude load data using one of the six different methods below. So we would create an idealized kind of varied loading, condition, uh, loading history. And then we apply that to our samples uh, and, and, and measure and record the crack growth rates under these sequences. From that, it can help us to tease out the relationship of prior loading to the crack growth rates. But it's experimental and very expensive. So now let's kind of go into more details on how these load sequence effects, what did that really mean and how it has an impact on crack growth. Uh, load sequence effects in essence mean the effect of load interactions where the current microstructural damage that is accumulated in a, in a, in a part depends, and the rate depends on the previous history within the part, right? So if a part has already had some damage, that damage state matters in the accumulation of more damage. One great way to kind of illustrate this effect is the effect of overload on crack growth. Uh, here, uh, we, we learn that overloads, uh, in, uh, um, uh, uh, overloads in, in tension or even overloads in compression can possibly retard or slow down, arrest crack growth rates. All right? In this example uh, that we see here, we have a... Uh, a component that is subject to cyclic loading, and it encounters a heavy overload before returning to that, that same amplitude or the original amplitude of loading. What we'll see when we look at the crack length versus cycles is that we'll have a, a nonlinear accumulation and increase in crack growth, and that when we encounter that I overload, we damage the microstructure and it takes a bit of time for the crack growth rates to actually speed back up again. This can be due to things like the plastic deformation at the crack tip, lowering the stress concentration. So the, 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 the actual crack becomes, begins to round out due to this plastic loading. And we can see that the previous path has a much higher rate and a shorter cycles to failure than this path after the up overload. Furthermore, it could be possible for us to do multiple overloads in tension or in compression that could extend the cycles to failure of a component. So we see here, we do one overload and then we cycle and then we do another overload and we see that that keeps our crack growth rates at a moderate value. Now we can't do this forever. Eventually enough damage, cumulative da damage will, will appear in our microstructure and we will reach the fracture toughness of our material and fail. Uh, we can also kind of see this concept in, in terms of the rounding and changing of the shape of our crack tip. Uh, it, so this is kind of a sequence that shows different parts of a stress uh, time plot for cycles and how the crack tip corresponds under those different loads. At the peak, A, we see that our crack tip is, is fully open and it has extended during that uh, a loading process. As we begin to unload, we'll see that our crack tip actually starts to close, and it starts to close well before the, the minimal value. Once we get to the minimal value, we have extended closure of the crack. And when we start to load back up from C to D, it actually takes time before the crack starts to open. So it'll, it can actually start to open here before we start to have further extension of our crack. How do we deal with this uh, sequence effects? How do we deal with overloads and underloads? There's a couple of methods we can use. We can use crack tip plasticity models that assume load interaction effects uh, occur uh, due to the large plastic zone that happens during overloads. We can use statistical models that relate crack growth to an effective stress intensity factor range and, and add some probability density curve to our load history. 
And lastly, we can introduce crack closure models that assume that the crack retardation uh, acceleration is caused by crack cl closure effects, which cause variations in the opening stress. For crack tip plasticity, there's some basic norm nomenclature we can use. Uh, AP, that is the sum of the crack length at which the overload occurred and the overload plastic zone size. AI is the crack at the ith load cycle. RY is the cyclic plastic zone size. And P is an empirically determined shaping parameter. With those variables, we can then apply a model such as Wheeler's model that helps us to define the size of our plastic zone and the amount of retardation or, or uh, uh, arrestment of crack growth rates that we see. Where in Wheeler's model, AN is equal to A0 plus the sum of CI times our stress intensity range equation. And where CI is the uh, uh, parameter uh, for the ith overload. So now let's uh, kind of summarize variable amplitude loading. We've learned that it is important for us to simulate service failures as closely as possible. Uh, they may, uh, may be valid or invalid, uh, validate your assumptions about service loading conditions. It is important for us to determine by testing or by agreement the service load histories for which we are designing for. Infrequent one-sided overloads are expected to produce sequence effects in our material. And these sequence effects can either cancel each other out or uh, 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 retard or arrest crack growth or even be entirely unpredictable depending on the level of loading and the material that we're studying. Only a few overloads in the load history can have a significant effect on the fatigue behavior and notch to crack components by producing beneficial compressive or detrimental tensile residual stresses in the, in, in the crack tip or notch. And let's not forget that fatigue analysis and prediction alone for complex variable amplitude load histories and service conditions is not sufficient because there is the possibility for interaction effects and because it, we may not really know the service loads, it's important us for, to do, for us to do laboratory tests and field tests to provide the empirical evidence, the real data, for us to validate our predictions. So uh, the assignment for this chapter for variable amplitude loading is problem 9.5 and 9.9 .9 from the textbook. I'm Dr. Stewart, and the references for this uh, uh, series of lectures is the textbook, Metal Fatigue and Engineering, the second edition, as well as Shigley's Mechanical engineering design. All right. Well, thank you for watching this video series. Uh, I'm going to work up on uh, some example problems and look for the example videos in a few days.